Yeah. 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 It's a, there's a lot going on. Wondering if some of those agencies, this could be more of a consolidation in New York. As many of the agencies are around the world, ILOs in Geneva, yeah. Environment in Africa. I don't. Habitat in uh, Nairobi, mm. Kenya. Yeah, that's right. And they will have a conference in Turkey. Mm. Welcome. Welcome very, very much to Conversations. Well, I'm pleased to welcome to the program Dr. Bertrand Chartel. And uh, Dr. Chartel is uh, a former, a former um, uh, advisor of science applications to the United Nations. He's currently a, uh, an international consultant in, the, in a wide-ranging field of economic and science and technological questions. And uh, he is, a, I know, a member of the Club of Rome. And uh, Dr. Chatel, welcome very, very much to uh, Conversations. I wonder if I might. Uh, we want to talk. We have a great deal we want to talk. There are many, many challenging questions that you're particularly interested in with. Now, with, uh, but I wonder if maybe you could share for the audience y your own background, somewhat your own, uh, you know, personal background and your maybe your academic background, and then how you came to be at the UN. And then we could get on to some of the things that you're particularly concerned with. But mm. could you share your own background a little bit with us, please? Well, uh, I'm uh, initially an engineer in the. Um, electrical field in the um, University of Paris. And then uh, I um, studied also economics at the Institute of uh, Political Science in uh, Paris. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then uh, after uh, several uh, posts in the French uh, industry, mm -hmm. uh, industrial engineer, I uh, had a post of um, uh, chief engineering in the European Space um, Agency. That wouldn't be Ariane. This was a, no, Ariane is a French program. Oh, I see, right, but I see. This these are uh, satellites and, uh, uh -huh. and rockets for a European uh, program. I see. Mm -hmm. Which is associated with uh, NASA uh -huh. in, in uh, many ways. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, I uh, become involved in the United Nations as a in the Office for Science and Technology, in mm -hmm. the uh, area of uh, science and technology applications, especially for uh, developing countries, for uh, development. Oh, I see, yeah. That's yeah. a really big and challenging question. Uh, yes. The science and technology is developing so rapidly, isn't it, in yeah. our time? No? Yeah. The, change the idea quickly. is to promote uh, s s technology projects in mm -hmm. the developing countries to train uh, engineers and scientists in the developing countries so that they can, in turn, select uh, appropriate technologies for their own uh, development. I wonder, you know, the United Nations is an institution that we want to support. It's had great difficulty. It's had attacks from people from the basis of sovereignty and all of these things we're all aware of and so forth. But, say, in the United States, we have, we have the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, Guy Ford Stevers and others. It, would the office that you've been involved with, how long has there been an office within the Secretariat, or where, where did it position itself? Uh, were they, uh, the people who were decision makers and policy makers and so forth at the United Nations could get good scientific and technological understanding made available to them, particularly mm -hmm. with... Uh, with a realistic economic understanding that you brought to it as well. Mm -hmm. When was that? Was that introduced right at the beginning in the establishment of the yeah. Charter, or was it more or less introduced uh, more recently? Uh, science and technology is not mentioned in the Charter, uh -huh. the UN Charter. Mm -hmm. But in 1962, uh, there was a conference on science and technology for the benefit of developing countries. Mm -hmm. And since then, there was a committee, an advisory committee, to the Economic and Social Council, which was intended to promote uh, science and technology projects in the developing countries. Mm -hmm. The idea being that instead of exporting uh, developed countries' technologies to the developing countries without reference to their needs, there should be uh, in these countries scientists and engineers who would select themselves the appropriate technologies for their own uh, problems and resources. All right, yeah, yeah. that's very good. Yeah, that, I mean, that's very good. There should be, you know, some people have said, if I may, some people have said uh, Marshall McLuhan, I think, 
it was who coined the term that we live in a global village because of yeah. the communications technologies and so forth. And we're coming into informational age and, you know, communications and telecommunications policy issue questions. The miracle of the silicon chip with the computers coming down. Yeah. Some people have said it might be well possible for some of the developing countries to, in a sense, leapfrog many of the problems that the industrialization process had in Europe yeah. and North America and other places and be able to move perhaps without some of the encumbrances yeah. of, the, uh, of the historical patterns of building satanic mills that uh, yeah. William Blake and other people wrote about, if you understand. Yeah. It may be possible for, for some of these new technologies to, to find application yeah. in the developing world more easily than some people might have thought, and they don't yeah. have to go through that developmental process as, as, the, as the, developed, the currently developed countries had to do. Do you, do you think there's any chance that yeah, the world might be seen that way? I think you are right because, uh, there are, first of all, there are resources, mm -hmm. natural resources. Yes. In the developing countries, sometimes much more than in the developed countries, mm -hmm. we got the mines and all sorts of uh, resources. In agriculture, in some places you have four crops a year. Yes, well, in a temperate climate, you have only one. Mm -hmm. So there are advantages which, uh, for which there should be a special uh, technology applications to... Mm -hmm. for but unfortunately, or in a certain sense, as an economist, you'd be aware also that the trilateral or the developed countries, if I'm not mistaken, you would know much better than I, but they still account for probably 70% or so of the world domestic product or whatever we call the, the, yeah. the economic development is still in those developed countries yeah. and there still is a, a problem of the of the differentiation between the developed countries and the well-to-do countries and the yeah. developing countries. It's still a major sociological and economic problem that yes. we all have to address. But we are now in the process of uh, reversing this uh, process because the, um, initially the Developing countries had very little uh, part in the industrial uh, production. Mm -hmm. And the goal of the UN was to have 25% of the world industrial production done in the developing countries. Uh -huh. But now this goal is attained and more, even more oh. because uh, developed countries like the United States, for instance, uh, manufacturing less and less inside the United States and mm -hmm. instead we are trying to find some manufacturing in uh, Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Taiwan and many other places. <laughs> uh, they're, they're doing it very so quickly. Yeah, it is a very uh, yeah. revolution now. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, but there, yeah and, and there are some signs like even uh, there's a great deal of software that's being done now in India taking advantage of the fine yeah. minds that do exist there and many of these things can be done. Uh, you also have had this example of the Grameen Bank, which is an enheartening enheartn one in Bangladesh, where they began mm -hmm. to put some trickle-up small economic investments to small entrepreneurial, really very, very small entrepreneurial activities at a trickle-up basis. Mm -hmm. there, so there are some examples, but there is a problem with sub-Saharan Africa and other problems. And we still live in a world that unfortunately has uh, got a long way to go before it becomes yeah. a universally just one. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But you, 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 you've been in this position since, uh, you know, at, at the thing. But now you were also, if you may, if I may, uh, with the Club of Rome, right? And maybe you can yeah. share that, what it is for the people who might not know, and then we could talk some about it. So the Club of Rome has been uh, founded by um, Mixus Pexé, uh, an industrialist uh, manufacturer of Fiat, by the way, mm -hmm. in, um, in, uh, in Italy. And he had the idea that instead of claiming for growth and growth and expansion, we should be aware of the limits of the resources of this planet. Mm -hmm. And then we produced a book which was called, as you know, The Limits to Growth. And to grow, this right? was a real bombshell because nobody had really realized uh, that uh, we were limited in our resources and we should be careful not to exceed these uh, resources and to pollute uh, our planet. Mm. But now there is a new problem, <coughs> which is uh, unemployment. And work is shrinking, 
the volume of work available to be done is shrinking because there is automation, robots, there is an entry into the workforce of women since uh, several years, which has doubled the uh, work um, demand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And therefore, we have a new phenomenon, which is a shrinking of the work available and an expansion of the needs of the population, yes. which has to eat, mm -hmm. and when they are unemployed, they receive no money. Because yes, indeed. Our system economies, yeah. is such that it is rewarding only the, the minority of a population which is employed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you have in developing countries, for instance, 30 percent, 40, 60 percent of the active population which is unemployed, you realize that the majority of the population of this planet is unemployed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the minority is employed. And we are by our system, we are providing money, income, to this small minority of uh, employed people. Mm -hmm. and the well, they have the well to do. Or the, excuse me? The well to do people in the world, right? in yeah. a sense, yeah. yeah. And then uh, our system is completely neglecting all those who cannot find work. Mm -hmm. This is not their fault because mm -hmm. there is no no work available. Now, let, let me ask you, some people would say there, we've had all kinds of economic... You're an economist. You studied economists. Yeah. You studied uh, Adam Smith and Say's Law and Ricardo and yeah. we've got Shum Peter and we've got Lord Keynes and we have uh, Karl Marx and all of these different kinds of systems of economic analysis and so forth yeah. to try and understand. And most of these would have said that um, as the, for instance, agricultural workers were displaced by cotton-picking machines, the onerous task, picking the cotton, they then went into the factories that Henry Ford built in Detroit and provided the labor and found more labor opportunity in the factory making automobiles as the labor on the agriculture was displaced in the American economy. Yeah. Then they say, as we begin to have these things apply to industrial manufacturing development, that these people who are displaced by the technology will go into service right. economy. Mm -hmm. And always there will be more jobs, and always as the productivity went up, the wages would go up, and we can just distribute what it wages to everybody. Just let's get everyone employed. Yeah. If everyone is employed, then everything is going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the view that most people have of the world. You take exception to that, or that we're running into a new kind of condition that yeah. the historical condition doesn't give precedent for? Yeah, okay. Be because I don't want to change a free enterprise system, but mm -hmm. I just want that it be adjusted to our new problems of the century, of the 21st century, where unemployment will be wide, mm -hmm. will be widely spread. Mm -hmm. So. I think we should take into account this evolution of the world toward uh, the limitation of work. This is why I call this project the Limits to Work. That's interesting. The Club of Rome, and that was it, uh, Jay yeah. Forrester, right, had yeah. had contributed mightily in a systems way to the to the yeah. limits to growth. Yeah. And the, and the whole ecological movement, in, yeah. a, in a sense of that, right, and the and the smallest beautiful movement, and people, yeah. you know, all of that. But now yeah. you're saying. Mm -hmm. Not only the limits to growth, but the limits to work. That's yeah. an interesting concept. I hadn't heard that term used, but I work, think you've probably coined it or something. It's very interesting. Work, work is considered as our way to get income. Yes. Income and money is linked to work. Mm -hmm. So when we have no work, we have not provided for a solution, except some subsidies by governments or charitable uh, institution. We would provide uh, income at uh, below survival uh, level. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the industries, the manufacturers, they want to produce. Unfortunately, the majority of the consumers is out of work, has no money. Yeah. So their market is 
limited is going down. Absolutely. Instead yeah. of having a full market of a whole population of a planet with, with money to All spend. Right. Now, I'm going to be a little devil's advocate with you, right? Yeah. John Baptist Say, who was at, Carl, uh, at the time of Adam Smith, used to say that supply creates its own, I mean, supply creates its own demand, that there will be a supply that will be created by its own demand. Mm -hmm. And what do you say to the argument that most of the decision makers of the world, mind you, Mr. Clinton, yep. Robert Reich, yep. they are saying high skill, high jobs, high skill, <laughs> high paying wage jobs, yep. let's create. Um, Newt Gingrich here in the United States or other yep. world leaders are saying that the technology will create more job opportunities just as Henry Ford's factory created more job opportunities for the agricultural workers. Yeah. They said this has always been the technocrats and the Luddites were worried about technological unemployment. Always more jobs were created and yeah. more jobs will be created in this world and we shouldn't worry about this. What do you yeah. say to them? Well, I say that uh, we can observe uh, in mm. the world yeah. that instead of this dream mm. of uh, technology producing jobs and jobs uh, producing uh, income, we see exactly the reverse. Mm -hmm. We see the technology killing the jobs. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have more and more unemployed. This is what we see in the, in, in the market uh, of labor at the moment. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have a situation where the producers produce their goods, they store them in the shops, and then you have pedestrians walking in the streets, looking at these goods from which they are separated by a very thin sheet of glass, <laughs> <laughs> and also or plastic. by the emptiness of their wallets. Yes, exactly. And yeah. this is our situation, yeah. and the, the manufacturers, they would like to provide more and more goods. Uh -huh. They can't because these people are unemployed. How, and it's global. It's not only we see it. I mean, in France, yeah. they have unemployment figures of 14% or something. Yeah, no, they France, tolerate uh, very high unemployment figures in France. And here yeah. in the United States, where, where it's more deregulated or something, uh, we have um, a lower unemployment rate. Yeah. But many of those jobs, are, there are many people yeah. working full time, and yeah. they can't, uh, they're still in poverty. They're even, yeah. You know, there's even a group of people who work full time. They're fully employed and they can't manage to maintain a home. Fully employed, homeless in the United States because okay. their wages pay so little. Not many, but there yeah. are some like that. Yeah. But it's but also on a world scale, isn't it? It's a global problem. Tell. For instance, the United States is fortunate to have at the moment only 5% of their workforce <coughs> which is unemployed. But in Europe, you have a figure of about 10%, 12%, 15%. Mm. If you look at the youth, you have these figures inflated very much because you have the youth, the young people below 20 years old, 25 years old, they have uh, figures of unemployment of 25 percent, 30 percent, 35 percent. Those are the rates we had during the Great Depression in 1930. Yeah, right. Yeah, right, right yeah. And in China, for instance, we have privatization, which yes. is supposed to provide so many jobs. Yes. We are now forecasting that a level of unemployment in the year 2000 will be. 260 million persons. Holy mackerel. Excuse my language, but in China alone. China alone. Well, well I, I, you yeah. know, I've, I've seen some figures where there's as many as 800 million now that are un, un yeah. or underemployed in the world now. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, and it's a global problem, as you say. A global problem. Yeah. And these, this, this, this theoretical dream of yeah. all these jobs being created. And didn't it, if I may again, uh, drawing upon your knowledge as an economist, right, that, um, that, uh, that until 1973, mm. as productivity r rose, mm. so also did the wages rise of yeah. a great number of people and in general. Mm. But somehow after 1973, while productivity even might continue to increase, the level of wages slowly leveled out and yeah. it begun to come down. And yeah. even in industrial giants like the United States, this loss of income and yeah. future projected loss of income yeah. is felt even by not only the, the people at the lower end of the scale, but it's beginning to come into the middle classes in what we call yeah. downsizing yeah. and people who've been laid off and technologically dislocated, mm. right? Yes, yeah. you are right. Because, mm. And what is the cause of it? Mm. Because we have entered in, in a global market mm -hmm. where 
where Libra is competing from uh, Sri Lanka mm. to Japan to Hong Kong to uh, India, uh, competing with the uh, labor of the uh, United States or Europe, mm -hmm. so with very low wages, no social protection. Mm -hmm. uh, women uh, working for very little uh, wages. Even children. Children. children, children working. Even little children. With, eight euros Dickens. So we are considered unemployed. We are mm. considered employed. Mm. But employment of children. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is uh, something which is uh, very characteristic of the present situation. Oh. And we are in the un employment. You have many works which are useless. Mm -hmm. So this is very interesting for our purpose because we want to expand the present system to have the unemployed getting a salary. Mm -hmm. Salary lower Mm -hmm. than the employed to keep the incentive to work, mm -hmm. but to provide for consumers among the unemployed. You have to provide them, even if they are unemployed, you have to provide them a salary so that they can spend and consume as human beings. What a, okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, I didn't mean to interrupt, but if, if, if one were to look domestically, and traditionally we've looked domestically, but now since the Uruguay round of the GATT and the World yeah. Trade Organization, the world is just opening up into a global market, particularly for capital global and market, so forth, yeah. but in the world scale. But what about the argumentation of the people in the developed world who said they're going to not have to worry about diminishing markets, domestic markets, that they traditionally depended upon? Mm. Let the wages go down, the workers, mm -hmm. let the unions be undercut in their power to bargain in all the traditional ways in which, you know, the workers within the domestic economy, say the United States or other of the countries, be undercut and so forth. But we will develop our markets in the third world. We will go into yeah. the developing world and we can develop plenty of market for our goods. And besides, we're multinational and yeah. we're not particularly tied to any one country. Yeah, is that a problem? And what do you say to that? And can they find sufficient market so they don't have to worry about the discontent that's going to manifest itself yeah. uh, in, say, you know, the, the political turmoil that's been felt in the United States and other Western countries? Yeah, this is a present solution for the United States, the Pacific Asia market, the Latin American uh, market, and this is uh, how it happens that the uh, United States are in a very good position as regards uh, unemployment. Because, for the moment. For the moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, this may be for a short time. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that, that, but it is important to do that. Yeah. It, 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 if, if it may, there's a, the, um, uh, this is a pretty, a very unhappy picture. We, we want to go into the fact also that, uh, that most people of the world, as you say, depend upon having a um, job in order to justify income. Yeah. Because the principle that you must contribute to production to have income from that production yeah. is wanting to be vouchsafed. And um, most of the capital, most of the technology, uh, the stock ownership in a private property economy or the, in, a, in a free market economy is owned by relatively few people. Uh, that's one yeah. point that we could go into, but and most of the people in the economy don't have ownership mm -hmm. uh, in any great measure as a, as a way. That's, a, that's another possible issue. But I wonder, mm -hmm. I know you're interested in the fact and have been involved in trying to cooperate. There was just recently a major summit meeting in Copenhagen, yeah. and you wrote, if I'm not mistaken, a paper in collaboration with people at the International Labor Organization or International Labor Office, and I wonder maybe you could talk about that and the, what they're yeah. beginning to look at, this question of world uh, uh, problem of work. The um, International Labor Organization is one of the oldest uh, agencies in of the UN system, mm -hmm. and their main uh, interest is, is uh, employment and labor. So they, they have prepared a, a, a report for the committee. I have it. While you're on, talking, I'll show the report. Yeah. You can come in. Go ahead. Keep talking. For the UN World Summit on uh, Social uh, Development, mm -hmm. which has um, been uh, convened uh, in Copenhagen on uh, the 6th to 12th of March mm -hmm. of this year. So this is very recent. Mm -hmm. And ILO has proposed a number of uh, measures and, and, and um, remedies for the present situation. Uh, 
and uh, these are the lowering of tariffs, the expansion of trade, and uh, also the, um, p promoting the employment in uh, developed and developing countries, and uh, also uh, financing of uh, unemployment. Yes, right. <coughs> this financing, is, uh, they have three proposals in the ILO report. Mm -hmm. First of all, there would be a tax on the movement of capital. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, capitals are moving uh, very rapidly from uh, New York to London to Frankfurt to Hong Kong. And there is a tremendous amount of capital which is moving around. And so much it, of it is just speculative. Yeah, yeah. for speculative. Yeah. Derivatives and things. We always say, oh, there is no money for the unemployed. But there you have a flow of finance, which is fantastic. It is estimated that one thousand um, billion Zillion. dollars a day. A trillion dollars, yes. It, it yeah. is moving every day from uh, these uh, financial places. So Mr. Tobin, mm. who is a Nobel Prize, uh, has proposed a tax mm. of 0 0.25 percent of these uh, movements of capital. Interesting. And this would provide an amount of 900 billion dollars per year. Mm -hmm. This could be used for whatever uh, project uh, could be proposed uh, for uh, unemployment, for instance. I see. I, I wonder if I could. I don't want to, sure. interrupt, I want to interrupt your thought. Now, these, these report, this, re, this which I show, this report, the World Employment 1995, mm -hmm. this was a report came out by the ILO, ILO. With, yeah. uh, with Michelle Hansen as the Director General currently. Yeah. Now, this which you're talking about was part of, it became incorporated in part of this report, yeah. or was in a certain sense separate from it, but in collaboration relating to the meeting that was just held in Copenhagen. I wonder if you could make that clear. This, uh, so are these ideas proposal in this? was uh, included in the report of the ILO for the preparation of a Copenhagen meeting. I see, okay, yeah. fine, okay. So this is one of our proposals. Yes, the second right. proposal is to increase the, the money which is uh, generated by the International Monetary Fund, mm. which is called the Special Drawing Rights. Mm -hmm. There is a, a, a global reserve at the moment uh, of the world of $1,000 billion. Mm -hmm. And this creation of money involves $29 billion. Mm -hmm. So there is still a margin for more uh, creation of money in this way. Mm -hmm. Now there is another proposal which is by Mr. Uh, Brady in 1989. Brady, Brady mm -hmm. excuse me. <laughs> That's quite all right. <laughs> For the forgiveness of debts. Yeah. Because uh, the developing countries are loaded with uh, debts. Absolutely. And then uh, this was a proposal to alleviate uh, these uh, debts. And it has not been applied yet, but this would be a source of... Uh, uh, of uh, improvement for the uh, present uh, situation. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. So, and 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 th these were some recommendations, and then that became part of the fact that the International Labour Organization, which you indicated, is now seventy-six year, seventy-five years, yeah, it's been yeah. in existence. It came into, and it is international. Yeah. It is concerned with labour problems, yeah. and the lab the problems of labour are international. The multinational corporations are doing very well at the corporate. Yeah. management level, but they they have taken cognizance of the fact of the problem of unemployment and underemployment sure. around the world in yeah. this particular report oh, yeah. here in 1995, yeah. and they're taking particular cognizance of that, yeah. don't, don't, don't you think? Yeah, I, yeah that's right. Yeah. And uh, in, in a new and different way, do, do, do you think that um, this, this question that we said before, this, this question of, I, I like your term very much, where you say the limits to work. Limits to work. Yeah. And this, this view that you're putting forth that, uh, you know, the technological displacement of uh, workers, this is, a, this is a new condition, and there are many people in responsible positions. Do you think the, re the leadership of the world, presidential or otherwise, understands adequately yet, as it were, the yeah. implications of this new technological unemployment that is likely to descend upon the earth or have systems yeah. to deal with it? Or is it a yeah. problem that's yet to emerge in the consciousness of decision makers yeah. and general citizens? What I think, uh, frankly, is that 
there is a vice in the, in the system. So we have to go to the root of the problem, to the cause of the present uh, spreading of unemployment in this uh, world. Mm -hmm. And for this purpose, I think we should set up a small uh, nucleus of uh, scientists, engineers, uh, financiers, bankers, uh, economists, who would gather in a closed uh, area so that they could not go out before they <laughs> produced like a solution, conclusion. like yeah. a conclave, you know. Yes, right, right. Yeah. Yes. And like Mr. It's like Jefferson. like the cardinals selecting the Pope. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And then they would look at the present situation where we have a system with two parameters. Uh -huh. If you work, you get money. If you don't work, no money. Goodbye. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Two, start to look into another system which would be composed of four parameters. The four work, parameters. I'll just parameters. No problem, no problem, Excuse no problem, me. yeah. So, first one, work. Second, money. Mm -hmm. Third, needs. Needs, perhaps needs of unemployed also. Mm -hmm. And unemployment. Mm -hmm. Put that in the computer, make a model, start to try different solutions, different financial flows, so as to see um, which one would optimize the, a new system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this new system would uh, take into account not only the workers, mm -hmm. the employed, but also the needs mm -hmm. of the unemployed, which mm -hmm. are the majority of the population of this planet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is my, the idea. Well, we've, we, you know, we've just had, if I may, okay, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that's a good idea that this be addressed again. It doesn't seem to me to be either by our decision makers in official halls of Congress or internationally or in the media yeah. or in the general press. It doesn't seem to be brought yeah. up. There just seems to be almost like there was a view at one time that the uh, sun went around the earth, a heliocentric view. Yeah. And the fact came to be clear that the Earth was actually going around the sun. And all of the, you know, so it's a paradigm, yeah. a new paradigm yeah, on yeah. a very large scale yeah. that is yeah, called scale. for. Yeah. And it isn't recognized yeah. even within the broader yeah. intellectual community or from yeah. the economists themselves. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a, very, a, a very real problem of just recognizing, yeah. recognizing the problem. So it would be very timely for the 50th anniversary of the UN. Yes. 75th the, anniversary of the ILO. Yeah. Yes, right. For the end of this uh, uh, 2000 uh, centuries, mm -hmm. uh, going to the 21st century, mm -hmm. and then we could look at the economic system in which we are living since so many centuries and see if we could not improve a little bit what is, uh, has been uh, concocted uh, now. So, <clears throat> and uh, then you had the same situation in the United States after independence. You had Mr. Jefferson. He went to his home in Madison Estate. Mm -hmm. He stayed there for six months. Monticello. In Monticello. 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 Thank you for the pronunciation correction. It's correct. You're right. <laughs> yeah. After six months yes, of intensive work, mm -hmm. he produced the American Constitution. Yes. So this was a new constitution of a whole continent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, similarly, I think some people who are experts, who are knowledgeable, who, who, who know the, the problem of the situation, they should start to think about uh, imaginatively uh, a new system uh, for, for our economic uh, situation. With all due respect, I'm afraid that many of those people are already employed by our think tanks and are turning <laughs> out PhD theses on defining the old problems or in terms of the old paradigm. If you, uh, there were many people who were engaged by the royal heads of Europe to talk about the nature of a world where the sun yeah. went around the earth. And yeah. they had that, you understand, there's that, yeah. that sort of a problem. One of which, though, one question you brought up, and I just want to address, but is you said that on the basis of need, uh, the Soviet Union or the socialist approach, let's yeah. say, or the collectivized governmental control, where distribution of, um, of, of, of um, economic resource was done in the basis of need. Karl Marx would have said, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. 
Yeah, but now it does, that it, seems to be under question by many, many people. Yeah. And even here in this country, we have sure. this reform of what they call reform of welfare. They're not yeah. going to let anyone have anything based on need. Yeah. They want to have people contributing yeah. by having a job. And yet the contribution of the jobs to the production yeah. is less and less all the time. So right. we're in a schizophrenic yeah. Yeah. catch-22 pretty mess, don't you? No? Yeah, you're right. Uh -huh. But I see an incentive for this type of uh, change in industry because the manufacturers are now very limited to a market composed of uh, employed people. Mm -hmm. They are the only ones who have money, who can spend, consume mm -hmm. their products. If a system, an economic system would be found to provide money to the unemployed, mm -hmm. which means 60% of the inhabitants of this world, mm -hmm. then Amazing. you would have a market for industry yes. which would rise by 60%. Amazing. Yeah. And Fantastic. If, yes. And if I may, you've had a scientific and a comprehensive concern uh, for development, limits to growth, and an ecological yeah. concern. Yeah. We don't want to rape the planet and destroy the ozone uh, and so forth. We, we want to do it ecologically appropriate, but we do also have the wonder of the new technologies that can do ever more yeah. materially with less, the silicon right. chip and other things. Yeah. So it may, it may well be that we can have an expanded market of material goods and services for the world population without destroying the planet in the in the yeah. process, which yeah. would be one of the promises. Yeah. If but we can but find the economic means that allows us to do what we're appropriate and ecologically, technologically and scientifically capable of doing to provide yeah. for the people of the earth. Yeah. But we haven't found the way that allows us to do that. And yeah. that's the major problem, and I would agree, if, I wonder if you feel that, if it is, it's a major problem confronting mankind as we come up to the end of the yeah. millennium, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. Uh -huh. and then uh, you would have, um, uh, the people would be in a position of active duty. When they work, they would be on active duty. And then, as long <coughs> as they work, they become obsolete, because they are far from the latest developments of science and, and technology, and then uh, they have to be recycled to the new uh, progress of uh, technology, and then they become in reserve. Mm -hmm. Then the, the workers in reserve is a new name for the unemployed. We are not unemployed, we are in reserve for a future employment. Mm -hmm. And then you would have a recycling of uh, active labor into reserve, and the reserve labor coming back on active duty. I see. And if you have a loop like this, mm -hmm. recycling the, the labor so that it spreads more the labor possibilities, yeah. and also it, it retrains the workers in the latest uh, development. Yeah, and, and it, it could be in a certain, and we might be able to perhaps uh, uh, lower the work week without the yeah. compensation. I mean, we could lower the work week and, and spread the work around. It'd be one. If I could, there's another. We're familiar both here. There's a book. I there's one that's addressed. There's been a couple recently. This one I would show. I, I it seems to me this is this is called the end of work. This is one that. Uh, uh, Jeremy Rifkin, who's one of our uh, freelance intellectuals in this country, he's written a number of books, Entropy and others, has written on this particular subject. Happy to say it's got a, uh, you know, Robert Heilbronner and Wazali Liantiev, I think you're probably familiar, he's a Nobel laureate, Mr. Goldsmith, and others have uh, put their stamp uh, on this book. There's another one that um, is called The Jobless Future, by no. um, a, a socialist Marxist-oriented Stanley Aronowitz. There begins to be some people who begin to address yeah. this problem. But on the whole, most of the economics profession yeah. and the academics and so forth tend to be, or do, I wonder, do you think, tend to be trying to use the old yeah. system of distributing only by the labor or yeah. using the old system rather than looking at the dimension yeah. in the sure. degree that is, is of the reality, as you say. There is another example. It's where Healthcare, 
in the health care system proposed by uh, Mr. Cl Mrs. Clinton mm -hmm. uh, as, as uh, compared with the European uh, health care system. You get health care without work. Mm -hmm. So the link between uh, need and work is disconnected mm -hmm. in this system. Same, same for the food stamps of the United States. People get food without work. So it's an example of yes, a disconnection of a link. Yes, but this, 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 this principle is being attacked by so many people. Right. Eh? But it has to be extended mm -hmm. to, to uh, people who don't work because they cannot find a new work. Mm -hmm. And you have an example also. You mean you, it's going to have to be extended in a certain sense? It will have to be extended. Right, right. And then we will um, have work pretext. We, we will have uh, activities for work which are not uh, very necessary, mm -hmm. but which are a pretext to provide income. Yeah, Mr. Rifkin uh, postulates that, uh, he says that the private sector for-profit, looking at the American economy, uh, economy accounts for maybe 80% of our production, 14% is government, and then he said there's the not-for-profit sector, you know, he said there's a yeah. growing not-for-profit <laughs> sector in the economy mm. and that we should encourage that yeah. you know he said we should encourage that kind of thing if only for because not only do you have a problem of distributing income people get their sense of identity and purpose sure. from these uh, psychological uh, psychological uh, yeah. sense of identity yeah. from that uh, yeah. from their uh, job yeah for which they are rewarded, which they also get income, but their identity is right. Mm. And this is, be, you know, so it becomes sociologically and politically yeah. important that there be other functions that uh, people can yeah. perform, perhaps outside of the for profit yeah. sector. Yeah. You have another example in nature the ants. Mm. Do, if you look at the ants, you find many, many, you find the queen producing yeah. without family planning mm. uh, lots of <laughs> little ants. Yes, yes. And these ants are then working mm -hmm. full time. Mm -hmm. full, it's a fully employed society. Yes, right. So our problem is to design a human society mm -hmm. with a capacity for freedom, our famous uh, brains, uh, utilizations, and there to have a full employment that the ants society have already implemented. Well, I wonder if we talk about words like work and job. I'm not sure if you know the etymology where the word job came from. I'm not sure if it's connected to Job uh, from the Bible. I'm not sure where the word job <laughs> came from. But uh, work, I know as sociologists, say work is like if uh, someone is engaged, an artist, at doing what they really want to do, Mm. They're at their work, a, a writer or somebody creative. I mean, that's work. Somebody mm. doing something that they don't want to do, which has come to be associated often many people's job minds with jobs. Yeah. And it may be that some of those opportunities for people to be working yeah. at what they want to do, maybe it's music or creativity or writing yeah. or yeah. acting or cabinet yeah. making or something that they want to yeah. do, is a different thing necessarily than doing what robots increasingly are going to be able to take take yeah. over the yeah. onerous tasks yeah. that has made up the mm. the the, the, the uh, you know the job functions if you understand what I'm saying yeah and at the moment there are a lot of jobs uh, well processing mm. when uh, we have found a way to speak before a word processor mm -hmm. and having a word processor starting to type. Mm. Already written oh, many, Kurzweil, I think, has this. This is uh, Kurzweil. Really? And uh, wow. then uh, we, we will have heaps of uh, jobs of word processors mm -hmm. who would be in the vacuum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is coming. And the, the, one, of the, one of the unfortunate aspects of that is that these these technologically augmented productive systems can produce very high quality items, uh, material items, uh, um, television sets and things that people would very well want to have. There's, there's, a, there's a factory in Japan that turns out television receiving sets that people would want to have and there's only two people. In it. It's all robots turning it up, but the product is very good. 
So provision. that we, do you understand that we, yeah. you know, we, and it's a shame that we don't have a system that's going to allow people. And people want to have those material things, and they have a right to mm -hmm. them. And it's not fair for those of us who live in the developed world to say that the people of the developing world don't have a right to yeah. a materially improving standard yeah. of living yeah. in the name of some sort of ecological. Yeah. imperative or something. Says, do you understand what? That's yeah, one that's, of the, that's one of the yeah. questions of justice. Right? Yeah. So therefore, for us to rely, and as in the old times, on work, to provide uh, for our needs, our money, our income, it's becoming a dream. Because the economic situation, the technological situation is changing, and our old uh, friend uh, work, mm -hmm is disappearing day by day okay. and therefore we have to find another way to distribute money mm -hmm. to give money allowances to people to fulfill their needs because the work is no more able to provide for this pretext well you put your finger in your mind if i may say so in your concern you and your fellows uh on what i agree with you is the major problem confronting mankind as we look forward from this point. Yeah. And uh, I congratulate you on all that work, and I look forward to our continuing uh, collaboration and collegial discussion of these issues. But one other aspect of it is uh, that we didn't bring up is that there are two components, at least, or there are two components that go into the productive process, and one would be labor in all of its aspects, jobs, but labor mm -hmm. in all of its aspects. The other is the capital instruments, or the robots, or yeah. the patent rights and all of the corporate intangibles that are on the capital side of the equation yeah. and all of those non-labor aspects of production the ownership of them if we're not going to have a collectivist system where we're going to distribute according to need as they tried to do in the Soviet Union and so forth there's a question of equity in the world that we have to have between the developed and the developing world yeah yeah um, so that's a that's a big question. I wonder if I could address one 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 issue again is that on this social this tract of where they're distributed according to need. Uh, that seems to have been under question. Do you, do you think it's possible that we might be able to expand ownership of some of the technology? I mean, you have technology on one side of an equation, and you have labor on the other in terms of overall production, yeah. and not very many people own technology or own the robots. Yeah. And is there anything to be said for possibly expanding ownership ultimately uh, access to credit so they can purchase capital assets that will pay for themselves out of the future rather than only out of the savings, if you can understand yeah. what I'm saying, which most laboring people do not have, yeah. and then open that up as a way of distributing income into the future um, by having them have a ownership right, as the capitalist now does. Yeah. In the future, we could have a democratic capitalism rather than a plutocratic capitalism yeah. where the ownership is so narrowly held on a world scale. I wonder, does that make any sense to you, or is that something worth investigating? Yes. Uh, we have I to think deal with the an financing. important yeah. uh, point. Mm -hmm. But let me say, first of all, that um, <coughs> you don't need to buy all these shares because, as you well know, uh, people are copying uh, the technologies of the United States, and they don't need to buy mm. the ownership mm. because they just copy it mm. we were, uh, relentlessly. Uh -huh. This was a whole negotiation between the United States and China uh -huh. to try to halt this uh, copying. But, uh, as you say, this would be a, a good uh, advantage for the developing countries to try to uh, to be a part of the uh, ownership of uh, high technology uh, companies, and this is uh, on the way because the multinational corporations, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. we, we cannot manufacture anymore in the United States profitably, so they are expanding, particularly in developing countries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We are setting up uh, branches, factories, and uh, administrative uh, arm in uh, a number of developing countries, in Europe, in the Pacific, in uh, Latin America. All these multinationals are expanding, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore 
having expanded in these countries, they need to give an interest, an incentive to their uh, collaborators in these branches. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And therefore, then this is where the sharing uh, uh, of, uh, of ownership would be an advantage to, because it would be an incentive for uh, management and uh, labor to, uh, um, to g provide a good quality uh, products and to be interested in the result of, of, um, uh, of the whole operation. Yes, it, it, would, it would also open, it wouldn't it, it would also open up all, if we think 25 years, or we think yeah. generational, 50 years out, Yeah. you know, it would also open up, you say that the only way, if I may, the only way that most people have to justify having income yeah. to buy food and clothing mm -hmm. is to have what we call a job, a job. or labor yeah. relationship mm. to production. Yeah. Now, if the production is increasingly technology, yeah. and the labor is less and less important, mm. and the production could be done without the labor, then the question comes up of who owns the technology, the robots? Yeah. Yeah. And if someone owns the robot, mm. do they legitimately have a right to income from that ownership yeah. that then makes it possible for them mm. to have the money to buy which the robots can produce, yeah. to understand. Mm. But at the moment, most of the capital is owned by relatively very few people, yeah, few and most people. people in the population never think of getting yeah. income mm. for buying or meeting life's purposes by a, a reasonably democratic portfolio of ownership that they have of yeah. the of the robots you understand uh, maybe a yeah. democratic ca uh, capitalism with a democratic face or something yeah. of that yeah. sort is what i'm saying or expanding yeah. the ownership yeah. beyond the relatively narrow base i yeah. don't know well, a binary sort of principle of economics yeah. there are two aspects in what you are saying first of all when you buy shares on the stock market you become an owner of this technology. Mm. You become an owner. So this is a regular uh, yeah, proce that, process to, yeah, that's to, to be an owner, uh, owner of this uh, companies. And also there is the new aspect of information technology. Mm -hmm. You have all around the world now data banks, mm -hmm. data, data banks. Yes, sir. And they are connected now, internet. And we, yes. in every laboratory research center, you get by the computer the information of the newest technologies. Mm. And perhaps not the whole story, but a great part of the story mm -hmm. is known as soon as it is produced by all the research centers of the world, which are interconnected yes. by the information, mm -hmm, by the mm -hmm. communication mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's a, it's a global uh, market of technology, which is a very worldwide uh, network now. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, and yeah. ever more so. It's ever developing. More so, yeah. Ever more. And, and they, these are the things that are creating... It's a, it's a global village, and it's one in which... Uh, you know the the connection of the uh, the the connection of all the people is is becoming ever more real. We live at a time of incredible transformation. You're a scientist yeah. with a wide view. Uh, the mitochondrial DNA shows us that we all come out of Africa. Apparently, the whole of the <laughs> species of uh, yeah. 200,000 years ago, and we reach a point of major transformation now uh, with uh, with weapons to systems and possible ecological trauma. Yeah. and so forth, and all of the curves are going up like this. Yeah. We come at a time of a qualitative yeah. transformation, and the real need that we have is perhaps yeah. is to think, if I may suggest, is that we think anew, yeah. a new system beyond that which historically we've been operating in, in terms of. Yeah, because um, as you have mentioned, the centrally planned economies, a former Marxist uh, countries, uh, the um, former uh, Soviet <laughs> Union, the community of independent states. They had a kind of full employment mm -hmm. at a very, very low level. Mm -hmm. We got a very low income, but the system, as you as you mentioned, 
was trying to get employment to everybody. This has collapsed. And there, at the same time, a big hope has started on the free enterprise systems in all these countries as a way to provide full employment. Mm -hmm. And this is their hope. And they have believed in that. Yes. And if we continue to deceive them as regards yes. employment, mm -hmm. this would be a very strong blow to the principle of the system. Yes. Because, and therefore, we have to think about um, reorienting the free enterprise system so that mm -hmm. it includes the needs of the unemployed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we we will uh, face explosions. We, we, we Sociological, will, political, social, political, like yeah. in the crisis of 1999. Yes, unemployment, yeah. 40 percent in the United States, mm -hmm. sometimes 60 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, coffee burnt in the Brazil and all these things, and therefore. Uh, we we have to to find a, a new remedy. To, we must to, think anew. Uh, yeah. We must think anew, and this is something that has been concerning you as a as a scientist yeah. and as an economist yeah. for a considerable period of time. Yeah. And you've been helping to move things in that direction when you were at the United Nations, and you continue to do so as an international consultant. Yeah. Are you optimistic that there's enough willpower and enough brain power? Or yeah. enough Vision. I am. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bush used to deride the vision thing. Yeah. He would say, but there are a thousand uh, lights, a thousand lights. Uh, but is there? Do you think that we can summon a vision that can begin yeah. to think yeah. anew? Because people are very accustomed to change, and a yeah. change of view is yeah. very, very difficult. The institutions are in place from yeah. history. I am optimistic, and I will tell you why. In the science and technology, you have witnessed since two centuries, a fantastic array of innovations. The world has been completely changed in regards to science and technology. But in the economics area, you don't see this change. It has not happened yet. Mm -hmm. So therefore, my, my hope is that the economists will start thinking a new system, mm -hmm. just like the scientists have imagined uh, communication, the telecommunication, the television, the, all this uh, uh, communication uh, world which we have now. And therefore, the economists are behind. I am sorry to say that, mm -hmm. but I think this is their turn to start innovating uh -huh. uh, boldly. Or maybe, as they said, there's a saying that the war is too important to leave to the generals. It may <laughs> be that this question of the broad economics is too important to leave to only the economists, or yeah. even to specialists yeah. who are specialized in a particular field. It's been a specialist path that has led toward extinction of so many species in the evolutionary development. Yeah. There may be a time for a systems or a comprehensive understanding, yeah. which I know the Club of Rome report and, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth has had and others, a, a comprehensive thinking that is called for. And it would seem to me you, as a sci with your scientific advisor, advisor to the United Nations and the people that you've been doing and your continuing work, is one of those who contributes to that search for that holy grail or that question of how we can find the key that can allow us to make this qualitative transformation which is economic. Finding an economic system that allow us to do what we're capable of doing is the major problem and I congratulate you very very much on all of thank your you work. Much. And I, I thank you very much for coming into the program. We've just scratched the surface but uh, great pleasure to meet you. It's a great pleasure <laughs> to meet you sir and yeah. it's been your pleasure in the cable television audience uh, to have the perceptions of Dr. Bertrand Chattel. Again he's the uh, a former uh, scientific advisor to the United Nations or of scientific applications to the United Nations he continues as an international consultant in these matters. He's in the phone book in New York City for those who would like to be in touch with with him and happy to have been able to share those perceptions and to have welcomed you to Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And we here on Conversations invite you to tune in. We'll be coming back again next week. That's it for this program, Dr. Chattel, once again. Thank you very much for coming in and for all your work. Thank you very much. Until next time. So we just do that. But So what we'll have, we, we ought to um, 
try and get together here. In, yeah. You know, in the next couple of weeks or so. Yeah. Maybe with Michael yeah. Kagan and some of the other yeah. people. Yeah. We, we could have lunch in the UN one day. And also Mr. Rifkin, perhaps. Yeah. You know? You know, we could have a lunch in the UN. Uh, yes, but like I think to yeah. make a discussion, continue our discussion. Yes, I yeah. think we've only just begun. Yeah. And, and then uh, I have papers I want to send you. Okay, some literature, right. yeah. and I got your literature. Yeah. So, um, and we could uh, perhaps try and um, uh, address this problem yeah. together. Yeah. yeah, I would or, be glad to. Or with others, yeah, yeah. because yeah. it's a major one, and I uh, this. Uh, We'll be we'll be doing that in the. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I'm sorry we had a little diff. We've had some of this uh, difficulty, and things are rushed always when you're in the studio. But.